because you study the photographs, the Edwardian world was a world of contrasts, a world of divisions, a world of rich and poor. This image was taken by another pioneer of Edwardian photography. His name was John Galt, and he used the camera in quite a different way to Horace Nichols. For him, it wasn't a means to celebrate society, it was a weapon. A weapon with which to record and campaign against social injustice. Unlike Horace Nichols, John Gold wasn't strictly speaking a photojournalist. He didn't sell his images to the press. Photography wasn't even his livelihood. He came from Elgin in Aberdeenshire, but in the 1890s, he had moved south from Scotland to work with the London City Mission, a Christian organization working with the urban poor. His first beat was Bethnal Green, then Poplar, each day he walked the streets of London's East End spreading the word. Each night he wrote up what he saw in his official mission diary. Poverty is very acute in my district. I was making visits from door to door a few weeks ago in a short street containing only 12 houses. I saw six families in a state of semi-starvation. There was one house shared by two families. The husbands out of work, no food, no fire, children crying most bitterly. One of the children, aged about seven, but old looking, was pinched with hunger, faint from want of nourishment. John Galt was a keen amateur photographer, and he used this hobby in his mission work. His pictures, printed onto glass slides, were used in magic lantern shows to raise public awareness and funds for the poor. His collection preserves a unique glimpse of the underside of Edwardian life. I wouldn't say Galt took particularly good photographs. They're not a patch on Horace Nichols. They're a bit grubby, the composition's scrappy, but they're real. That's what I like about them. They have the flavor, the smell of real life. Look at this one, a woman making matchboxes. According to Galt's notes, she worked 16 hours a day and got two and a half pence per gross of boxes. This one's another home industry, mattress stuffing. You got one shilling per mattress. This one's extraordinary, the detail on the faces. They're blacksmiths, the man and the woman. They made household shovels and dustpans, mostly from scrap. You walk the streets Galt walked today, they're mostly unrecognizable. The slums were either cleared in the 30s or blitzed in World War II. But you can still find echoes of the East End Galt New. He photographed the bird market in Sclater Street. They sold budgies and canaries as domestic pets. And the site's still a thriving market today, full of Sunday traders in the heart of London's Bangladeshi community. In 1900, four-fifths of the population of Britain were living on or below the poverty line. The early sociologist Seabone Rantree calculated that to feed and clothe your family at a subsistence level, no luxuries at all, you needed 21 shillings, 8 pence a week. A woman like Galt's matchbox maker earned just seven. In a skilled trade, if you stayed in health and in work, 21 shillings was about average, but the trouble was, there was no safety net for the bad times. If you fell sick, if you lost your job, there was no system of social security on which to fall back. In old age, if you'd put no money aside, you had nothing. And times were getting harder. In the early years of the 20th century, wages were stagnant, prices and unemployment were on the rise. Every winter in recent years has brought sickness, want, even death to many of the poor of this city. Doubtless there are many who are destitute through idleness and sin, but there has also been a larger amount of unemployment than usual. 
We mustn't blind ourselves to the truth that there are many amongst the unemployed who deserve the sympathy and help of the rich. In 1906, the Conservative Party split by internal divisions was ousted by a liberal landslide. For the new liberal government, the problem of poverty was high on the agenda.